Hello fellow future enthusiasts. On Demystifying, we do deep dives on science, futurism, and speculative technology. My name is Thor, and I will be your host today. Arthur C. Clarke wrote in the novel Rendezvous with Rama of Pluto's solitary moon, the existence of which Clarke predicted some five years before Pluto's moon Charon was officially discovered. Assuming planets have undocumented moons is a logical enterprise. The solar system has a virtually endless number of satellites we do not usually recognize formally or have not yet named. Pluto has a moon was not an incredible or unlikely claim. But, what if an author correctly predicts not only the number of major moons a planet has, but also their orbits? Would this also be a logical assumption, or does it indicate some great luck or wisdom? This is what Jonathan Swift did, the 18th century clergyman and author best known for the Gulliver's Travels series. In the books, a civilization living on the flying island of Laputa, quote, discovered two lesser stars, or satellites, which revolve around Mars, whereof the innermost is distant from the center of the primary exactly three of his diameters, and the outermost five. The former revolves in the space of ten hours, and the latter in twenty-one and a half. The notion of Mars having two moons is not new, but it is not as well explained as some think. When Galileo discovered rings around Saturn, he encoded an anagram in Latin containing this discovery to allow his peers to learn of the findings without alerting the religious authorities who held him under house arrest at the time. This anagram was misinterpreted by Johannes Kepler as Hail, Twin Companionship, Children of Mars. Two Martian moons. When the message really contained, I have observed the most distant planet to have a triple form referencing Saturn's two sets of rings. Jonathan Swift may have been aware of this interaction, but this is pure speculation. Prescience, or a strikingly accurate prediction, is not unheard of in astronomy. Was Swift simply guessing, or was he so knowledgeable about astronomy as to realize that any undiscovered Martian moons would have to be very small and close to the planet? Perhaps he was aware of some document or observation we no longer have access to in the historical literature, Imagine if some unpopular astronomer of the time saw Phobos and Deimos, but could not replicate their findings to prove its existence, a mystery leveraged by those with interests writing what was essentially science fiction of the time. These thoughts are inconclusive, but do illustrate the depth of this mystery. Phobos exerts a tidal force on Mars, causing the planet to bulge a few millimeters as the moon passes overhead. Each time the moon completes an orbit, it loses some energy and falls about a centimeter. Eventually, the tidal forces received by the moon will exceed its Roche limit, causing Phobos to break apart in the Martian atmosphere. Phobos always faces the same side of Mars, in a state known as tidal locking. Tidally locked moons are not abnormal. Tidal locking is a terminal state moons will gravitate towards as they remain in stable orbits around a planet. Therefore, they tend to be older, sometimes with origins dating back to the formation of the planet itself. Moons captured within several hundred thousand years are usually not tidally locked, but will tend to eventually synchronize. Phobos completes an orbit nearly every eight hours, meaning its orbital rate is not related to the length of a Martian day or any other characteristics. To understand why Phobos is frequently described as an impossible moon, we need to understand the relationship between it and Mars. There are two primary factors that influence how quickly moons synchronize their orbit. The time taken for a synchronous orbit to be sustained is inversely proportional to the square of the moon's radius, and the time taken for a synchronous orbit to be sustained is inversely proportional to the planet's mass. In other words, bigger planets tidally lock moons faster, and smaller moons are harder to tidally lock. Unlike our Luna, Pluto's moon Charon, or the moons of the gas giants, Phobos is not a spherical body. It is known as a potato-shaped moon, and such bodies undergo irregular rotational forces, making them less likely to become tidally locked. Both characteristics, size and shape, are not highly unusual on their own. But together they are intriguing, no other known moon besides Phobos has these attributes in a similar situation. 
Phobos is so close to the surface of Mars that it could easily act as a pivot point for a space elevator system, as proposed in a study from the NASA Langley Research Center in 2003. Objects leaving Mars would be attached to the zenith of the elevator, suspended just at the edge of the Martian atmosphere, then ferry to the farthest end, imparting a total 2.5 kilometers per second of delta-v on the payload. Phobos could be used in a multitude of ways to simplify accessing Mars. Mission planners have described Phobos as an opportune location for a command center where humans could remotely control exploration robots on the Martian surface in real time without descending its gravity well. Another proposal discusses using chemical rockets to agitate regolith on the surface of Phobos, generating a large cloud of dust which stretches into a ring at an altitude of around 6,000 kilometers over Mars. Vehicles could use this cloud of dust to decelerate in an aerobrake maneuver, and this cloud could be used repeatedly before dissipating. The Soviet Union sent two probes to Phobos in 1988, Phobos 1 and 2, flown on Proton-K rockets after cooperation with a number of nations, including the United States. Phobos 1 encountered an error during its journey because of an order uploaded to the vehicle, which contained a single mistyped character. Because the Phobos vehicles used physical memory modules which performed a variety of functions in the vehicle training environment and during flight, when the wrong action was called, what resulted was a vehicle state intended for the training environment, eventually leading to loss of control. Phobos 2 managed to reach Mars' sphere of influence, where it took photos of the Martian surface and Phobos. It completed all of its objectives until it was expected to transmit the beginning of its detailed analysis of Phobos' surface, which never started. Failure of either the communication system or the battery have been speculated. Subsequent missions to Phobos included Phobos Grunt, a soil sample return mission, which failed before leaving Earth's orbit. Other Mars missions also imaged Phobos, including Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Express, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Being the focus of a number of space programs and cooperative efforts, Mars is a veritable graveyard of probes. The failure of the Phobos probes is unfortunate, but not surprising. Monoliths on Earth are comprised of a single massive rock, usually a volcanic plug left over after a volcano erodes away. Smaller monoliths can form from eroded fragments of boulders as well, so are not always volcanic. South of Stickney Crater on Phobos, at the edge of the Kepler dorsum, there is a single geometric-looking monolith, often discussed due to its remarkably unnatural appearance. This structure is described as a cube-shaped rock about 90 meters wide by 85 meters tall. It is the only geometric or monolithic structure on Phobos. The Phobos monolith is not the only structure of its type we've seen yet in the solar system beyond Earth, but its location makes it difficult to explain. The accepted theory is that this geometric block is a remnant of an asteroid left protruding from the surface. Yet, we have not discovered any other monoliths that might strengthen the fragment argument, but quite the opposite. If impact ejecta can produce geometric-looking monoliths, we should see a lot of them on our own moon and even Mars. Well, this is where it gets interesting. We also have monoliths on Mars, but these are even more perfectly geometric. So much, in fact, that they do not fit the impact ejecta conclusion at all. They've instead been described as purely geologic. Layering from rock deposition combined with tectonic fractures creates right-angle planes of weakness such that the rectangular blocks tend to weather out and separate from the bedrock. Or in other words, broken pieces of a cliff. This explanation works on Mars, where water and wind erosion have been factors, but on Phobos these forces are absent. The Martian explanation is closer to the geologic monoliths we're familiar with on Earth, yet the conclusion is seemingly premature since erosion conditions on Mars are not yet well understood. If erosion caused these rocks to snap, shouldn't they be eroded further and still not apparently geometric, and shouldn't we see more than just a few of them in isolated locations? At the end of the day, we have two different explanations, both unproven, for the remarkably similar-looking monolithic structures on Mars and Phobos. The only way to resolve this problem will be to visit them. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object 
that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? Well, uh, the universe put it there. If you choose, God put it there. No matter what explanation lies behind the Phobos monolith, what it represents is more important. It is a beacon of discovery, beckoning humans to come closer for a better look. Whatever that means, whether it's more valuable data or a new exciting realization, has yet to be seen. Thanks for watching everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's content. Please leave a comment with any questions or statements you have, and please like and subscribe to help grow our audience. Thank you.